This is an SM Media production. <laughs> Hi everyone and welcome to this week's edition of the Scottish Football Show here on SM Media. I'm Scott McPike, I'm your host again, delighted to be here. Joined this week again by, back with popular demand, we're joined firstly by Mark Wilson. Mark, welcome back to the show mate, how are you doing? Thanks Scott, thanks for having us back on. No worries, and the Auckland Lake Talbot. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, we're back as well, Mark Shanklin's back on, the Auckland Lake Talbot hat man. Mark, thanks for coming on again. <laughs> Yeah, no worries. Cheers. And we're joined as well last week by one of the one of the best strikers in Scottish football in the past ten years or so. Brilliant. That's kind. Brilliant to have him on. Andy Andy Barman, formerly of Dunfermline, Ross County, and Inverness. Andy, thanks very much for coming on. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. No, oh, pleasure's all mine. Thanks for having me. No worries. How you been? You all right? Good. Yeah, good. Just uh, strange. Obviously, everyone's in the same position at the moment. Just. Strange times, but no, I can't complain. All good. Right, back, just buzzing, back, buzzing the footballs back on. Aye, it's a bit different. It's, uh, it's obviously I, I like to go and watch a game every Saturday. It's obviously not being able to get to the many games, but it's a wee bit different watching on the TV, especially with no fans and stuff. But listen, we've got football, haven't we? And we were complaining so long there when there was no football, so we can't complain too much. It's just great to have it back. I we'll just make a wee a wee start. I want to start as well. Just some sad news over the weekend. Former Hearts and Rangers defender Marius Zalukas sadly passed away at the age of thirty six. And I just want to ask you first of all, did you you would have played against Marius? Like, how did you find him as a an opponent and as a a person? Just it's a a bit of kind of sad news. I think we're all kind of shocked just by we don't I don't think anybody knew he was ill. But it's just a sad sad loss. Just kind of tell us a wee bit about your kind of memories of him. Andy? Oh, I mean, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, it's too, you're far too young, 36 years of age. It, it, you know, it shouldn't even be talking about that, really. It's it's a tragedy. I'm played against him a few times when he was at Hearts. Mm-hmm. Difficult opponent. Uh, obviously, when all moved to Rangers and stuff. So, I actually didn't realise he was he was 36. I thought at the time I played against him, he was maybe a wee bit older than me. I didn't realise he was so young. He must have been must have been really young when he came across the Hearts because he was there a while ago when he was there. I was surprised when I seen that he was only... 36, I thought he was a bit older, but no, I mean, a great defender and, you know, had a really good time in Scottish football. I think most people would, if you ask most Scottish football fans, regardless of what team, they would all say he was, you know, he was a pretty pretty decent defender. So, um, it's a tragedy and, you know, thoughts are with his friends and family. Definitely. Send our condolences over. Shan, because I just want to ask you as well, like, do you, you can I get any memories of him yourself? Like, just watching him? Uh, I just... The only memory is really uh, is him leading that uh, the Hearts team to to the Scottish Cup, the famous famous victory against the uh, Hibs at Hamden five one. And you can only echo what Andy's saying; it's a tragedy. Thirty six. I never realised a lot of a lot of players, especially maybe defenders, are, are still kind of kind of playing football at the age of thirty six. So I, I I thought he was actually older than that. So as I say, it's an absolute tragedy, and uh, it'll be Scottish football's loss. Mm-hmm. But sadly, missed. It's a it's a right shame in the game, but I'll join everybody and just wish him well. Thoughts and prayers to his family and friends and teammates and everything else. But it's just a sad loss. Uh, we'll start off with the games over the weekend. Obviously, a pretty big weekend with the Scottish Cup semi-finals and a few games in this Premiership. We'll start off with the first semi-final over the weekend, which was Hearts against Hibs. It was a tough end-to-end game. I thought it was really, really enjoyable. Hearts get the 2-1 victory, the one over extra time. Liam Boyce got a penalty. Kevin Nisbet sadly missed a penalty, but uh, Wigton gave Hearts the lead and Doig equalised before Boyce got the winner on the extra time. Uh, I'll start with Andy with us. Just how, what, did you watch the game, Andy? What were your kind of thoughts of the game overall? I missed the game live. I caught the highlights later on. Um, I think obviously Hearts been a good side, you know, the Premiership side. and you know, Obviously, Hibs have been getting loads of plaudits this year. They've been going well and they're, they're riding high in the league and they've Results, so I think it was just two kind of evenly matched teams, and they both kind of cancelled themselves out given what I could see the highlights. And there's always going to be a tense, sort of tight affair with the no fans and stuff as well, probably didn't help in the weather and the conditions. So it was a really tightly contested game. I um, wouldn't say there's much quality really in terms of attacking, flow, and play, but it was certainly entertaining for that point of view. In the extra time, there was plenty of, plenty of stuff happening to 
that he probably went entertained, that's for sure. Yeah, definitely. I thought Hearts, are, Hearts were pretty attacking. They set out just to try and kind of ruffle Hibs. I got into a pretty kind of tough contest. And Wilson, I just want to say, like, you were talk, we've spoken the past couple of weeks about Craig Gordon, just obviously with the kind of Celtic goalkeeping situation. But how important was he over the over the game? Like, they just they made a few vital saves for Hearts to keep them in the game, I thought. I said this to you a couple of weeks ago, how anyone could let Craig Gordon go um, from a football club. Um, he, and again, he proved again on Saturday in the semi-final that he's still a real top-class goalkeeper. And I, as I said, I wouldn't say, no disrespect, I think David Marshall's done very well since he came back. Well, he's been the number one choice. I know he's been around a long time. But for me, for availability, Craig Gordon's still the best Scottish goalkeeper out there. And, uh, Again, I think he proved that uh, on Saturday and, and a big game as well. You know, a derby, as Andy said, you know, they're, they're the division below. Um, and I actually thought, kind of, over the piece, kind of, I actually thought Hearts probably deserved it. I thought they showed a wee bit of experience laterally, you know, when the likes of Naismith come on, Andy Hald, you know, they've got some very good players, the guy Halkett at the back as well, um, yeah. in the Gordon. So, despite the team was experienced, and I thought that's how they were able to see the game out. Even if Nisbet had scored the penalty, I still actually fancied Hearts to come back into it. Mm-hmm. And Shankers, I just want no, to... I think, though, it's playing in your mind. You know, he's tried to be really, really <laughs> precise in putting it in his end up in the bar, but he's tried to put it you know, as far away as the goal as he Aye, can. Right in the post stump. You know yourself, Mark, as well as a striker. You know, when you're trying to... When you're facing against a goalie who's got the reputation of Craig Gordon, it plays in your mind, you know, whether they're going through in a 1-1 or if it's a penalty. It, de- it definitely does, you know. You think to yourself, this guy's a good goalie. I'm going to have to really make sure I, I make a good contact. And sometimes you can overthink things. And I think maybe that is, but no miss much this year. So I think that's yeah. maybe played in his mind a wee bit as well. Mm-hmm. And Hearts move on to the final was obviously like with that, with that result. I thought it was a pretty even game. I think that Hearts did kind of probably deserve to win. But Hibs will do their missed chances. I feel that they'll feel sore at just the fact they had a few chances at the end. They just never took them. Like Shankers. Do you think you know, Hibs will feel hard done by not to, not to progress or did you see the game similar to us like Hearts deserved it? I thought it, I, I, th- I don't think they can say they were hard done by. I think both teams had uh, plenty of chances but as you say, Craig Gordon obviously was man of the match. He, he made a huge difference. He had some big saves as I say early on with Fainisbet, ahead of Fainisbet and you think if that goes in after 10-15 minutes could Hibs go on and a great defensive display. I don't think for, for both teams it was very open. It was played like just exactly like a typical typical cup tie, you know, probably. I don't I see just touching on it, both penalties. I don't think any of them were actually penalties in, in my opinion. I think they were both both soft penalties, uh, to be fair. But uh Hearts probably just edged it. Uh, I would say just, just for the sheer fact the the league below and they probably had to work that, that bit harder than that. Uh, to, to actually win the game, but uh, probably probably fair result in the end. Mm-hmm. And Andy, just obviously Hearts have made the final, but do you think Hearts are going to come straight back up to the Premier League this season? I would suspect so. I I think in the squad that they've got, and you even look at their bench yesterday, and there's some strong players on the bench that they can call on Hardy, Naismith, you know, guys that would probably walk into a lot of Premier League teams in their starting lineup. So I know definitely, I think they'll. It's theirs to lose, isn't it? If, if they don't come up, then they'll see that as a failure for sure. Tough division, don't get me wrong, the Championship. There's some other teams in there that will fancy, fancy taking points from Hearts. But over the course, I expect them to comfortably win that league. It would be, it'd be a shock if they didn't. Yeah. Well, it's a great result for Hearts, but it was good to just have an Edinburgh derby back. We move on to another game on Saturday as well. Andy, you were at this. The D United played Ross County. The D United got the 2-1 victory. Nicky Clark got both goals. And Shaw pulled one back for Ross County, but it was kind of too late. That puts the United up to fifth, and Ross County are sitting at eighth. Andy, I just want to ask your takeaways for the game. Obviously, you saw it live. Like, what did you kind of notice during the game? Like, how did it? How was it going? And you, like, what did you kind of see? Um, again, it was it was two teams that not really been scoring a lot of goals recently. Um, you could see that. You know, there, there wasn't exactly. I don't think, to be honest, both. Goals had any saves to make other than the goal sound, sound crazy, but I don't think they did. It was a freak penalty that the first goal it was a, a, a mix up for Ian Vigers, the Ross County captain, and you know, he's misjudged it's come out there and he's, he's practically caught the thing. So it, it's just sort of how it's going for Ross County at the minute. They keep 
think that's some like four penalties or something in the last four games. Is that right? Something Aye, crazy. Something like that. that like that. So Ross County had a lot of possession. You know, they, they huffed and puffed. But as I said, never really created anything. But I think Dundee United probably had two shots in goal. Maybe Pollock missed a good chance first half, I suppose. But it was a good move. Um, but I would say Ross County were well in the game. It wasn't as if it was a, a dominant Dundee United win or, or anything like that. And Ross County pushed second half. But they never, I think they would be disappointed what they did in the final third. They never really, never really that final pass or the cross into the box always kind of let them down. And I think if that, if that had been better, then they would have got something from the game because it was certainly well in it. Mm-hmm. I thought that as well. I watched the game. I thought there was kind of big takeaways. I took was like the D United probably deserved it. But Ross County, it was kind of end to end as well. I thought Ross County were pretty hard done by. They just obviously taking chances. But what's your kind of thoughts, Wilson? And the, like, how big a wins that for the D United? Because we've kind of spoken about this before. Like the D United, they've been kind of lacking. They've, they've got the strikers. They've got the firepower. They've just not been clicking. But Nicky Clark's got two get two goals. Like that's a it's like surely a big win for the D United. I think I think any wins, and as, we, as I say, we've spoken about last week. I think the likes of Ross County, Dundee United, Livingston, Hamilton, St. Marin, the other teams that you're going to have to take in what you get from these games to try and stay in the league. And I said I said I said at the start, and a, a wee bit of confusion with the whole Ross County thing about the joint managers. I've, I've never been under the impression that, that that's worked at any, at any stretch. And then it was a bit strange that one goes upstairs, and I just think there's a lot of uncertainty there. And uh, Andy's made a good point in terms of the creativity. Now, we spoke about the boy uh, Ross Stewart. He's decent. Um, but if you don't need to pass the ball to him, you know, it makes it a wee bit of a thing. And I think Gardine's getting used quite kind of sparsely just now. I think he's either on the bench or uh, coming from the bench. Um, as I say, I, I do worry for Ross County. I, 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 feel, I, feel, I feel that, and I'm not saying you have to rant and rave, of course not, but I feel Kettlewell, I don't know if he's got that in him. Andy may know different, but it just seems a bit accepting after the games that we've been beat and we go again and we go to next week. I don't, I don't know if there's much kind of. Is it? Is he going to tell the people out? Is he? Get the I mean, <laughs> to be fair, I, I, I played with Kets and he, he was that kind of player. You know, that's how he played the game. He'll be the first to admit he wasn't the most skillful, but he was a, a he was a real competitor. He was a, a real winner. And myself personally, I had a few runnings with him in training and stuff. He, he really, he, he really is. That's sort of how he, how he is, and how he played the game. And I'm sure, and I know a couple of boys up there, and I'm, I know he's sort of taking on his managerial. He's a young manager. He's learned his trade. You know the, these sort of things, these little slumps, and you know he come, he come in, and it was a joint manager. But I think it's always kind of took the lead anyway. I think Fergie was more of the coach on the, on the training field. But in terms of man management, and in the sort of dressing room on a Saturday, I think it's always kind of took that role anyway. Um, going by what I sort of hear, um, it, it, the first season in the championship again they were probably expected to win. The budget was probably greater than anyone else. So that first year in, I think probably now and probably second half of last season is when he's probably learning about being a manager. You know, it, it, that's when you learn the most when you're you're going five six games without a win and you know you're you're not firing. You can't score goals. That's probably telling him a lot about him and and the squad of players he's got. So. Um, I'd, to be honest, I didn't see a team yesterday in Ross County. You know, you, you know yourself. You, you can see a team, and the players are, are not doing it for the manager. I, I wouldn't. I don't think you could. You could say that about Ross County yesterday. I think they're, they're, they were well in the game against a decent Dundee United side. Um, I don't think there's a lot between that sort of five, six teams in that mm-hmm. middle bit of the, the division. And I'm sure Ross County will be fine. I just touched on Ross Stewart. It's important from last year. He was our Valley's man. He got their goals. He does a lot of work outside the box. I say that yesterday a few times, and he's, he's coming wide and chasing back. It's great, but at the end of the day, he's a main source of goals, and he's not in the box. He's not going to score goals, and I think he just probably needs to simplify his game a wee bit and get back to that what he was doing last year because it's going to be important for Ross County. If, if he's not scoring goals, mm-hmm. then you know the okay, Billy McKay's here and he's proven over the years, but I think Ross Stewart's a main man. And, if they can get him firing, then that will certainly help to, to get the results again. Mm-hmm, definitely. Shankers, what did you kind of think of the game? Was, obviously, you put, you, would you have played with Ross Stewart, wouldn't you? I've, I've played against him, and he was playing uh, in the kind of the lower teams of the juniors, and then he got a move to Cowinan, and then he's kind of, kind of moved slowly up. So, I've played him for that. Uh, 
I never actually seen the game, but I, I, last week I touched on if, if Dundee United are going to do well in the league, they've got Nicky Clark, McNulty and Shankland and, and their three goal scorers and, and it's kind of going to be up to them to, to keep them keep them firing in the league. And that one there takes them to first, I think, for a club like Dundee United, even though they've came up for the Championship last year, I think fifth, run about fifth, fourth, they've have to be, for a club like Dundee United, they have to be challenging and, and aiming for, for that side of the side of the table I don't think it's good enough just to come up and just accept that they need to just stay up in the division I think for a club of size of Dundee United they need to be challenging for uh, for the top four at least I think I read during the week somewhere that, that five teams um, are, have got the possibility of going into uh, European qualifiers next year for mm-hmm. for uh, the SPL so like if they're, if they're touching fifth then they're always going to be in a, in a chance for that That's probably where they're expected to to finish, you know, if your budgets are always there or thereabouts in terms of the where a where a team finishes at the end of the season. So they've got to be they've got to be pitching themselves into that sort of fifth and certainly top six anyway. It's when they've got that sort of squad and they're they're paying that sort of uh, salaries, they've got to be looking to, to be challenged rather than just coming up and scrapping for the fighting against relegation for sure. Definitely. A team that will take a lot of confidence as well. We'll move on to the next game. A team that will take a lot of confidence for the results, Motherwell. They went to the Tony Macaroni Arena and won 2 0 against Livingston. Uh, Lang and Watt get the goals. That puts Motherwell up to seventh after a tricky start. I think Motherwell were finally getting going. Like Shankers, you can agree. Like after the kind of Rangers game, they had a, kind of wee, a wee period where they hadn't played a game. But since then, they've come back and found their feet. I think kind of Tony Watt's finding his form as well. I think he's turning into a really kind of. A real talisman for them. I think Mullows won three, three of the last four and the three games they've won, they've not conceded a goal. I mean, uh, they've got to, got to be, be looking to take positive for that and, and push on and, and see a striker like Tony Watt, I scored uh, two in the last two games, see if they get him firing, they're going to be up that, that end of the table as well. Uh, I mean, they've got to, a couple of years ago to finish third. That, that's where they've got to be aiming. Mm-hmm. And, can I, Wilson, I want to touch on this with you as well. Like, can I, we looked at Livingston and we said that they, were, can I, they made can I, to their home stadium a kind of fortress in the past couple of seasons, but can I, this season they've not really done that. Like, what do you think? You, you know Gary Holt quite well. Like, what do you kind of think's going on with Livingston right now? I don't know, to be honest. Um, and I kind of watched Gary's kind of interview after the game and I feel it's always very positive, but um, again, and I was going to actually touch on it when Shankers was talking about Motherwell there. I think Dykes went quite late, you know, on the transfer. And I think Gary probably sorted his pre-season or whatever games he had playing with him, etc. Then it's a big loss. I think Motherwell did kind of more or less the same with David Turnbull. When they, you know, when they were lining up his training, etc. Turnbull would play and then all of a sudden he's away. And teams like Livingston and Motherwell don't have big squads that can just bring someone else in just to replace. I just think that there's just a lack of something. I think it's maybe a wee bit of creativity. A lot of guys that, that work hard at Livingston, um, and then, but I think I saw I saw the highlights. I saw the first goal. You know, it's it's just one of the ones. Um, and Bartley's just caught in possession of the ball on the Astro. It's sticky. It's windy, and he's just taking a, a bit of a bad touch, and they've, they've broke away and scored. Um, the first, and then Tony Watts doing what any number nine does, you know, just getting yourself in and, in and about, you know, 12 yards out, um, to score. Um, but Livingston's form is a worry. It's, it's definitely a worry, but as I said, and Andy's touched on it as well, we can, um, I, I think that the bottom five, six teams, I, I, I think they're already there. Um, maybe one or two shocks a lot along the way, but I think I think the bottom six, and see if you take Eden, and as I, I, I think we will be a bottom six team, if I'm honest. Um, I think they might finish top of that pile. Um, and as I say, anyone against one of your kind of rivals is, is, is very good. Mm-hmm. I, actually, I, I go to quite a lot of Motherwell games. I'm a, a local boy and I, I find myself down at Fair Park quite a lot and watched them a lot last season. I think the problem, Motherwell, Livingston, they're all the kind of same. It's a turnaround of players every year. Like, you know, yeah. they're, they're going to lose their best players probably more years than not, whether it's be like, a contract or selling them on, like, Turnbull and Dykes and that's just how it is for teams like that and I think Motherwell suffered a wee bit at the start of the season they had a bad start and there was probably five, six changes to their starting lineup from the team that played last year you know, Turnbull being obviously the most 
And, and in the European competition as well, that, that drains a lot. If you're not used to playing right. that amount of games and travelling, I know it was Ireland right enough, but you know, that, 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 can, that can have an effect it's as well. Compared, not used to playing it's all competitive games. It's all competitive games early on with it. You know, normally you've got four or five pre-season games in under your belt before you start playing these cutthroat competitive games sort of thing. So I, I think that played it as well. But probably Livingston in the same boat. They're probably going through a wee transitional league. Livingston have been what Livingston are and they get a bit of stick for hatchet men and long ball and all that. But you know, it works for them and it's worked for them over the last couple of years. And I think they're probably just finding their feet a wee bit, a wee bit of change of personnel and maybe just getting the new players in. I think I've got... Few, a couple of former lads and, and lads from up down south and I think it's probably just try to get the embed them into how this is how Livingston play, this is how we want to do things and it takes time, you know, but I'm sure they've probably they're gonna be hard to beat as as they always will be and Gary Holt I'll get them playing like that. That's the type of manager he is. So I'm pretty sure they'll they'll come good. But I thought Malo played pretty well and as as well as that, like as you say, like Livingston can I set up? They set up a certain way for Motherwell to kind of go in there and break them down and score two goals is a great result. But it's it puts Motherwell up to seventh. Like I wouldn't have thought Motherwell. I, thought, I knew Motherwell can I get going. I just didn't think it was quick. But it's a great result for Motherwell to go in a way ground like that. And we'll go with today. We'll move on to today's action as well. It was a big game for Rangers. They went away to Kilmarnock. Uh, one one now. It was kind of pretty. I kind of want to ask Wilson about this because I know Wilson will be have a keen interest on it. Uh, Tavernier get the penalty. I know you. I know you're like me and hate the, the new handball rule, but you can't. I don't want him to can say that there wasn't a penalty under the new hand, handball rule. But how big a results are for Rangers, Wilson, and which are kind of takeaways for the game? No, I don't think it was a penalty. First of all, um, no, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh, I, again, and it was a wee bit the same as the. The Hibs game the previous week, you know, Kilmarnock I thought were very, very flat, especially the first half an hour. Couldn't couldn't get going. But again, I'm I'm watching it was in a, the same at the, the old firm game. I'm watching Rangers, they've got great players. I, th- I thought Tavernier was excellent all, all game, to be honest. Um and and, I, and I'm looking at Rangers and I'm still thinking they can go through gears. I mean, obviously I don't watch them maybe as much as Shankers. Um, but I'm 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 thinking if if Komarno had got an equaliser, you know, first half, maybe up to the hour mark, I think they just sort of went right, we better up a gear, lads, and and just go and do some more. Um, as I say, I, I, again, I thought Razor were by far the better team. Kelly literally started playing the last kind of maybe 20 minutes, cut Broadfoots to the header. Um, but again, it, it's, and, and I, I think I said this to you last week. Um, I, I don't think Alan McGregor would care about having a shower after the game the last six <laughs> or seven games he's played because he's not had to make a save. The only save he had to make was a save for Brophy's free kick. As I say, Rangers are miles ahead. Because um, I thought, good, they maybe be a wee bit tired, but I thought they started to let Aribo none of us start in Madrid, but I thought they let Aribo play a wee bit today. Yeah, um, he, he looked nice and comfortable on the ball, a wee, wee bit dynamic, etc. Um, Barisic and Taverne were excellent. Golson was excellent as well today, just do, doing his job not trying to play, just go and win the headers, because Gabamba's been a hand, he's been very good for us. Mm-hmm. Um, as I say, Gold, Goldson had him, had, had him today, which... Uh, this is... Us. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, sorry. Um, Kelly. It's, it's, and it's, <laughs> again, it's home to Habs and it's home to Rangers. It's no points, and, 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 and that's that's what the biggest worry is. And as I say, I Kelly huffed and puffed and tried, but as I say, it was, it was just lacking something today. Again, I think if we can get Malone with that, that adds a different dimension to the team. Um, because we started, you know, we played with two up front, with Brophy and Kabamba, and we looked okay, we looked a wee bit better, scored a couple of goals. And then when you play the better teams, you go back to the five in midfield, um, and Brophy's been the one that's uh, been dropped. And as I say, there's no spark there, there's too, too many gaps from, you know, midfield to front, because they're obviously worried that a good team like me are going to rip you open. But... Uh, but as I say, I mean, we said before the game would be very flippant. You know, Andrew Dallas was the referee, so you knew Rangers were going to get something. And it was, but it was a stone wall. I have to admit, it was a, it was a stone wall. Um, I don't know what Ross Mullen was thinking, but I'll, I'll let him off for that. I don't know. Is he, is he claiming for offside or something? I don't know. If, I don't know why his hands up there. You no, know, you sometimes you use your arm to get up and stuff, but 
I just don't, it doesn't seem like something you would do. I don't know if he's got his hand up for a foul or an offside or something and it's there and then it just hits him, but... It's it, it, looked, it looked deliberate. You know, it just it's right in the, it was right in the ref's face, face after that. He's got a good flick on it. And uh, it's right in the ref's face. I if 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 win three 0 you don't mention it, but it's the fact that it's the only goal. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's, it's uh, it has cost you to an effect. But... Mm-hmm. Shankers as well as that, like we we kind of touched on it last week, you know, off the air that we said like how big a res- how can kind of big it was that Rangers were playing with a lot of confidence. Obviously, the result in Europe, the result against Celtic was a big thing, but we did look flat on Thursday night against Poznan, but I thought the first half hour this I thought the first half hour of the day I thought they were excellent. I thought they were just playing well. I thought Arebo was getting going. And then kinda of, once they once they scored, I think they were quite happy to just kinda of let Kilmarnock come out in the second half. And I think Kilmarnock came out with a lot of kind of confidence and making kind of made it made it more of a game. But one player I want to touch on was Cedric Atten, who again I got a surprise start. I was quite stunned when he, when I heard he was starting, but I thought his all round play today was absolutely sensational. I thought he just was holding the ball up well. He was oh, his all round game was just I thought was tremendous. <laughs> he, he, he probably prefers to play to play through the middle, but uh, he's played out in the right. I don't know whether that was it was obviously tactical. They uh, Kilmarnock had Callum Waters who isn't he a isn't he a big presence at wide so I don't know where it was him and an interview after it and, and he says he, uh, he was his man of the match today because he's he's been out in the cold a wee bit. He's he's there's no other break in the summer. He's he's come over to a new country himself. It's hard to settle in, and he's he's threw him in uh, probably arguably out of position, and and he's had a he's had a uh, a good game, and and, and Thursday night Rangers were flat, but uh, we touched on last week uh, the amount of the amount of options that, that the, the team have got, and you can you can swap light for light. Changes in the day, Rangers uh, made made a few changes, freshened it up a bit, and it, and it seemed to work. And Gerard must be loving it that. He's got all the options uh, to chop and change when they need it, and it seems to be getting it right at the moment. And another clean sheet uh, is another positive. But uh, I think it was good Rangers just to get the the win there and, and get the the Rugby Park Astro off their off their back now, and, and they can't use that as an excuse anymore. Mm-hmm. Well, just, 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 sorry, Scott. Just a point there. Matt said um, about uh, Gerald's interview. Now, now that, that this this for me is uh, that has has a is this the sign of panic a wee bit? Because he's in, 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 as I said last week, I think Neil Lennon has cracked slightly. Um, and I think, he, as I said, he's too invested in it, too involved in it. I, I saw signs of the kind of naive Stephen Gerrard in his interview after the game, where he suggested that, uh, that a lot of the Kilmarnock players were obviously not Rangers supporters. Um, I, don't know what he, I, I don't know what he meant by that, but is, is that crack starting to appear that, you know... He's thinking we're under a lot of pressure this season, and teams are maybe. And I don't think there was any terrible tackles in the game apart from Barisic is on buck right enough. But is, is this signs that Gerard's starting to crack now? Because it's his first interview since he's been the Rangers manager, where he hasn't questioned the playing surface at Rugby Park, <laughs> and albeit it corresponds with a victory. So I, I just, I just feel with his comment about the Kilmarnock players, um, I, I think he's starting to crack. <laughs> Are you speaking as Mark Wilson from SM Media or uh, or Mark Wilson, the Kelly season ticket holder? <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking. I'm speaking as a season ticket. I think it's a it's disrespectful. Now, it was a bit strange. I, I, must I, admit. I, I appreciate. Aye, Mark, aye. I appreciate Mark. If and, and obviously you guys will be in the position, of, Mark. If you sign for Manchester United next season, are you not going to tie against Liverpool? I, I wouldn't have thought that of you, to be honest. <laughs> no, no. I know. I know where it was a strange comment. It was a strange comment to be fair, but I don't know whether there's something happened. Uh, I don't know whether it's uh, after a previous game or something like that, or there's something being said or something, but it, I did find that a wee bit strange. It's, uh, I don't know why you would make that comment to be fair. He's cracking under pressure, Andrew. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> maybe, maybe. When did you kind of think of the game, Andrew? Like, I've just obviously, like, did you watch the game, eh? I did, uh, yeah, I did. I, I, Fairly comfortable for Rangers. Um, you know, I think they're at a stage now where they can make two or three changes, a game to game, and not be any weaker. You know, I think if they did that last season, then you would have been. But then they bring Morelos in from the start of the day. Obviously, he's been their top man over the last couple of years. Um, Aribo comes in, good player. So I think they've got a real strength and depth. Obviously, things are going well. So 
everyone that comes in, I think he's doing a good job of keeping everyone happy, keeping everyone on the top of their game. And, and um, they're, they're looking a strong side at the moment. That's it's, it's um, They're just chopping off the games, aren't they? And, you know, when they say they were great free-flowing today, but they're another win, another sort of comfortable win. And they just seem to be doing that. They, they're getting into games and they're just expecting to win now. And it's a good a good quality to have. And I think it's like most successful teams of when they're in that week in a routine, it's the same when you're losing games and you just turn up, you, no matter what you try, you lose a game. I think Rangers are just in that wee run now and their tails are up and they're just turning up expecting to win every week and it's a nice place to be. Mm-hmm. It's a big, I think it's a big result for Rangers just because of the fact that I think three in the last ten games, I think they've only won three times in the last ten games at Rugby Park. So, I, I, we kind of heard the phrase during the week, bogey team, I think it's a big dock off Rangers back and it is a, kind of, a big confidence boost. But the run of, I just want to touch on the run of games. We all look, like, Rangers and Celtic have got an absolutely insane run of games coming up from now to New Year. Like how how important is it going to, with that squad depth for both teams to have to have that going into this kind of massive run of fixtures that's coming up? I I I, I think it's in the modern game, isn't it? When you're playing at the top level, when you're playing across all the competitions, you need to have that squad, don't you? It's not the days of playing the same team every week, every game is. They're well and truly gone, and it's really important to have to be able to make a couple of changes and still still feel as if you're putting out a strong side. So it's going to be really important. You've seen obviously Celtic's played a wee dip recently, and they've probably missed three or four. So they'll put it down to missing that three or four, and the, the ones that come in on the when they're ready or when they're at the top of their game to come in and 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 hit the ground running. So it's going to be so important, and I think the team that can kind of keep keep the majority of players fit. Uh, for most of the games are, are, are going to be the team that comes out on top. Mm-hmm. And Wilson, what's, what, what do we kind of hang going forward? Like, how big, a, how big a result is that for Rangers going to the shallow, tougher rugby park and getting the win? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just glad that now that AstroTurf has passed the Rangers test and no, no complaints <laughs> on it. I'm just glad now that everyone's on an even keel and it hasn't been mentioned. Uh, but is yeah, the, the, the squad depth is going to be big. As, as I said to you a couple of weeks ago, Celtic were in a very, very shaky situation. Um, and I, I said, I didn't think necessarily it was a squad. I thought a change at manager. I um, still do think that, to be honest. Um, I've got slaughtered for that. Um, but as I say, now Gerard's starting to crack. It could be a wee bit more even <laughs> but over, over the piece. But I said, I said, sack off the League Cup, sack off the Scottish Cup. It's about 10 and it's about 55. No, no, nothing else this season matters. And I'm sure if you said to every Rangers supporter, do you want the two domestic cups in the Europa League or the league, they would choose the league and it would be exactly the same for the Celtic support and probably players as well, to be honest. I think you're right, but see, see the early European games. I think they've installed a belief and a confidence into Rangers. You know, just going getting the wins on the board, the early doors, and I think that's really helped them get to where they are right now in terms of that confidence and that, that ability. So you can't discount that. But obviously, you're right. I think anyone anyone in the right mind is going to is going to pick pick the league. That's what's all important this year. But it, it, again, it does help when you're you're winning games of football. Definitely. I, th- I think I think that's a good point, Andy. They have been playing well. You, you can't criticise Rangers. I think I don't think they were great against Ross County. I don't think they were great today. But they, they look as if they can. They, they can just go up a bit. They, they can do a wee bit more. But as I say, three, three midweeks, three, three, well, three Thursdays, three Sundays do. But um, see, tough I, schedule. I, I, the, the, the schedule's going to be tough. So that's why I'm saying sack off that Europa League. Just sack off. We're not going to win it. So. <laughs> we'll move on to the second semi-final of the Scottish Cup. Celtic. It was a must win for Celtic, I thought. It was a, they went Thursday night against Leo and get, I thought it was a decent result. They were 2-0 up and didn't they, they kind of held, they managed to get a two-each draw, but I thought they, were, they felt hard done by a two-each draw. But they got back to winning ways. They got a 2-0 win against Aberdeen. Uh, Wilson, I just want to ask you, like, how, how big a result is that for Celtic and how did you kind of feel watching the game? How, kind of, how did you feel they were getting on like, during the game as the kind of game progressed? Again, it was... I thought Celtic were good in burst in the first half. The first, you know, maybe 10 minutes, Aberdeen looked as if they were right up for it. And then when the two goals were in quick succession, two really good goals, to be fair. But again, the second half performance worries me. 
Um, I think now Len has decided that a four is going to be the best, uh, the best play you know, for his personnel. Um, but the, the second half performance was so flat and abject. And as I as I say, I'm, I'm, as I've said it, in the last three weeks I've been invited on. I'll probably not be invited on again, right enough. Um, is that there's something wrong? Now I don't know whether it's in terms of the personnel or the tactics or those favourites. I, I I don't know. But to go to go from I know it can happen, but to go from playing as, as there was spells twenty thirty minutes that first half Celtic were electric and back to what we've seen the last kind of two or three seasons. In the second half, it just dropped and dropped and dropped. And as I say again, and touch on what we said about Rangers, and it just a bit of fatigue sitting in. Are, are, are they tired? Yeah, I thought you that know, on Thursday night. I thought that too many Thursday games travelling, etc. I thought that on Thursday night. I thought when they went two 0 up, they kind of tried to keep it going. But see, once they got to the second half, I thought that you could see the tiredness kicking in, and I think the fatter the fatter team just got the kind of better of them in the second half. And I thought. But I kind of thought the day that they kind of controlled the game pretty well for when they went to an up. And Aberdeen will kind of ruin not taking their chances in the first 20 minutes, but it was a spot of brilliance for Ryan Christie to get the first goal. What I thought as well, like obviously the three at the back didn't really work, but well, it, I, it maybe did. Maybe they've known the kind of personnel to kind of fully supply it. But now, 4 2 3 1 has to be the kind of way to go for them because obviously Forrest is going to be a big miss because I think he's going to have ankle surgery in the next couple of days or so, but that's a, that's a massive miss for them. But how, how important is it that they kind of stick to the, the thing that's getting them back going, Shankers? Because a 4 2 3 1 to me looks to, the, to be the kind of best option for them now just to get that stability. I, I would tough to agree. I, I mean, they, they play the three. Uh, at the back and they lose goals and they played the four so and they've lo- they lose goals as well so it's obviously been hard for, for Lennon to try and find what is the, the best uh, obviously the last few weeks they've not had the, the no so no best players but like Edward Christie Forest players like that, that that are in your you're in your uh, first eleven uh, which is obviously difficult but I think for, uh, Tom Rogic he was a uh, Roger Rogic, whatever. He was a he was a stand up for me the day. Aye, I, thought that I think good. I said to one of my Celtic support mates, if if football lasted sixty minutes, Tom Rogic would play with Madrid because he just <laughs> kind of last a last a full game. I think he played eighty minutes a day, but obviously uh, that's just the adrenaline and stuff getting you through. But he's he's a substitute every game. But, but he was a stand up for. He was a standard for, for me the day, I think, when you get the ball into him. He, he's always in the half turn looking to go forward. Uh, it's, a, it's a massive difference. And, and obviously having Edward, Edward is your number nine. Uh, I think even when Edward's not on it, you just you know that he could produce that, that moment of brilliance. He's just these wee one-touch layoffs. He, he plays around about the box. He's he never really, he's not like a penalty box striker. He, he plays around about the box. But, uh, but I thought Celtic were good. And two goals after 22 minutes and... And the game's done for me, really. Do you not? Do you not think? And, and I, I feel it's the case with Cham as well, Matt. That Lennon's tried the three because I don't think Rogic and Cham can play in a two in the centre of midfield. And the Celtic look better with say Griffiths and Edward. If that would be my first choice too, anyway. So he had to sacrifice something, and it's just not worked. As I say, because if he goes, just say for example, he goes four four two. I would think it every day of the week it'd be Brown and McGregor. Because um, I don't think Encham and Rogic can play, so he, then he has to sacrifice a player, whether it be one up front or three at the back. And as I say, I, Rogic is a fantastic player, but I think you'd see a better Tom Rogic if he had two strikers making runs in front of him. Aye, aye, definitely. Uh, I think with Forrest, Forrest out, it's actually kind of help, no help learning, but made his decision a wee bit easier because he's he's just shifted Christie out to the right and yeah. and it gets him in the team, but. Say if, say if Forrest comes back and then you've got Brown, McGregor, Rogic, Christie uh, and Cham. He's, he's got a real headache uh, of who he plays. And uh, he likes El Yanushi and he's coming into a bit of form. Obviously two goals during the weekend and a goal in the cup final of the day. He plays off off the left. So it is, it is a headache. But obviously it's a good headache for, for Lennon to have. But for me, Christie, Christie, McGregor and Brown have to play in the team. I think that's the three best, uh, no, the three best central kind of players for Celtic but that that's uh, who I think Lennon Lennon will play if, if he gets if everybody's fit that's his, his three players with Forrest El Yerushin 
and Edward up top. But uh, I think that'll be the way it goes now with the, with the four at the back to, mm-hmm. to fit all the players in the middle mm-hmm. of the park. Mm-hmm. Just on a couple of things I want to touch on as well. I'd, we've kind of Shane Duffy's come in for a lot of criticism lately, but I thought today was his best performance in a Celtic shirt. I thought it was just solid. But I think what helped him was the fact that B. Tom was taking a lot of the kind of ball and just kind of that taking that away for Duffy kind of helped him just focus on defending. I want to say about the fullbacks as well. I thought Laxalt and Frimpong were were very, very good. I thought that I thought Laxalt played really well. Frimpong, I know Mark's not a big I know Wilson's no you're not a big fan of him, but I thought today kind of was allowed to just kind of do what he does best, just get forward and he had that kind of support. But just in the goalkeeping situation as well, I just want to touch on like obviously Bain started today and Barkas is another one who's come in for a bit of criticism. Like Andy, like who do you think is the kind of number one choice? Can I go in forward for them? I mean, what was it they paid for Barkas? Five million or something like that? Five million, five million pound or something. Like that. For me, what I've seen him so far, it doesn't look like a five million pound goalie. You know, mm-hmm. I think you pay that sort of money in this day and age. I've not seen anything. He doesn't look commanding. I know he's coming to a new country and everything like that, and it's it's, it's difficult. But I just don't see it in him. I just don't see why you would pay that money. Um, you know, obviously he's a good goalie or whatever. They wouldn't have signed him. But for the moment, I just don't see it. So I think he probably does deserve to get taken out of that firing line. And, and we'll see. Scott Bain's a decent goalie. Is a Celtic number one? Probably not. You know, I don't think he is. You compare him to Gordon and there is no comparison, really. So it's crazy when you think about it from that point of view. Just on Duffy, I mean, I think, you know, the guys played in the Premiership down south a load of times. You know, you don't play them out of games without being a... a a good defender. I think it's different to be a centre half for Celtic than what it is to be a centre half for Brighton. You know, probably with Brighton. I know they like to play football and that manager likes to play out for the back and stuff, but he's probably having to defend in the box most of most of the time with Brighton. You know, they're probably the team against the, the bit so called bigger teams. They're going to be backs to the wall and he'll be winning headers and that's what he'll be I think that's where his strengths are and that's what he's been asked to do. Now he probably does very little defending with Celtic. And and, and the odd breakaway, and, and I don't think he's the quickest, so he's probably defending high up the pitch with Celtic, and he's getting asked to start attacks probably and, and get on the ball, get a deeper position, and that I don't think that's his strength. So I think that's where he's probably struggled. Um, and and this, and today, today's a perfect example of that. Just stick him into battle against Cosgrove, a Cosgrove. Big just batter into each other for ninety minutes and win your headers, do the basics, and then let B Ton or I or, or Julian play. That's it. I mean, that's that's his strength. I don't think there's any question about that. You know, that's that's how he's made his way in the game. That's what he, he is. He's a big lump of a lad and he's aggressive in the air and that's what he wants to do. He wants to fight and wrestle with strikers and, you know, sometimes, you know, Celtic and Rangers are going to have the majority of the ball and uh, it, it's still going to be about that for most games. So he needs to just adjust to that and find his feet. But as I said, he, he don't play the amount of games he's played, the level he's played without being having some qualities, and I'm sure he'll he'll come on to prove to be a decent signing for Celtic. Mm-hmm. Wilson, I just want to touch on this with you finally. Obviously, the past couple of weeks, the main thing folk have said to me is, who's the new Lennon here? But do you kind of have the confidence, do you have the kind of thing now that Lennon's going to kind of take this in his stride and kick on for this? Like, giant, this, this is the kind of moment they do kick on? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, Simple as that. I don't. I, I feel. I feel. I feel. Sometimes it's it kind of papers over the cracks. Now, as I say, I and I've, I reiterate this. I'm not saying that Neil Lennon is a bad manager, okay? But going from the old firm game to AC Milan, now that's to a late Petardry in a week. Now that's 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 your, that's your big games. Okay, you're not going to play bigger games than that over the course of a season. Um, now, it's against Rangers, as I said, no motivation, no tactics. Rabbits caught in headlights against AC Milan. Okay, and then again, they were like that a wee bit at Aberdeen as well, and then crazy mistakes that they were making against Aberdeen, and something wasn't right. And again, I know everyone can't play Brown for 90 minutes, but the second half again showed, you know, that there, is, there is something missing there. Now, as I say, I'm not saying that's only Lennon's fault. 
there, there could be something within the dressing room. I know he had a, a, a shot at the mole getting out or the league team, whatever it is. Okay, that has no bearing for me. But there's, there's, a, there's an obvious relationship issue between the, the players and, and him at the moment. And again, you saw it with Todger last week sitting on the bench. And as I said, Celtic have got better players in Aberdeen. And all it takes is for Ryan Christie a bit of magic, El Yunusi a bit of magic. Aberdeen don't have that. Mm-hmm. Aberdeen have very good players like McCrory and all these guys, but they don't have that wee extra bit of quality. They're going to bring something out there for 30 yards and, and ping one in. Whereas, and that's what I think Lennon relies on. He just relies on that Celtic have got better players. Now, if Celtic's ambition is to finish second in the league every season, then, yeah, you'll beat Aberdeen's, Kilmarnock, St. Johnson, Dundee United, whatever. Celtic have the financial resources, the support, the infrastructure, as do Rangers. I, I don't think the, the ambition, I don't think Neil Lennon's got that ambition. I, I, I think they need to be a top-level manager um, needs to take them to, to the different level where your routine victories are against Rangers. I think Celtic were spoiled a bit with Rodgers. You know, given what Rodgers has done yeah. before he came to Celtic and what he's went and proved what he's done since he left Celtic, they were spoiled. He was a class above, let's be honest, he was. And obviously what happened and Celtic fans took exception to how he went about it and stuff, but they were spoiled. They were spoiled on him. He was that wee bit ahead of Celtic and Scottish football in general. You know, he has a step up from there. And you're right, I think he was taking that club, the standards and everything, just day to day. You hear, you listen to some of the players talk about him and stuff, just how they were improving them as a player, as individual players. He was just taking the whole level up a level. You know, he was just taking... That's what I'm saying. Is that not where they should be aiming, though? Absolutely. 100% I've said that for years and years. If, if Rangers and Celtic built a million-seater stadium, they would sell out every week. Yeah. No, I, I know exactly what you're saying. See, yeah, that, no, for sure. And, you know, Neil Lennon, was it the cheap option? Probably. You know, they were in a situation where, at that point, Rangers weren't proven to be that, that strong a, a competitor to them over the course of a season. So they probably could afford to go and bring in someone who, you know, could could get them over the line and see them over the line. And they did that. Um, but, You'll see if they fall any more points behind before Christmas, I don't think you'll see the board will, will, will react and I'm sure, I'm pretty sure they'll look to, to replace Neil Lennon with somebody, somebody um, of a higher profile. I saw, I saw Martin O'Neill up the fort today. I was up the shopping centre, I saw Martin O'Neill kicking about, so just watch that one. <laughs> Depends on who's on the bench. Do you think it's a huge risk if they were to go and lose a couple to then bring in somebody new to then start a new process, like it's no his players, it's it's maybe no what he would like. I know, I know he's not got much to do because it's a middle of season. But if they're doing it, and they would need to do it before January, so as they could give somebody uh, money to spend or whatever. I just think it, it would be too big a, a gamble. And if you ask a Celtic fan who is an obvious candidate to go and replace him, who who is if they got one, I think most well, of them would probably say Neil Lennon is is probably the kind of like. For, to take Celtic to 10 in a row, Neil Lennon would probably be the perfect person right now because there's no Safe obvious candidate yeah. for me. It's, I think that's somebody the big thing. Yeah. Somebody that knows the club inside out, etc. So, no, I, get I just that, think it would be too big a risk. I think this, this season's um, different from any other season and I think you'll find from both sides, you know, if Rangers find themselves behind, you wouldn't see them, the, the, I don't think the manager would change, but the players that they would invest in in January, I think this season's just different. It's just completely... It's just nothing we've known for a long time, and I just think decisions will be made based on that rather than what's what's right in in the, in the future and whatever. I think it'll just will be a bit of panic sets in from whatever side is trailing from the year. There's too much to gain and too much to loss, I think as well. The, we've got delighted to have a special guest on Andy Barrowman. Just delighted to have you on. Just as well, just started your career at Rangers. As, as a schoolboy, didn't you? Aye? Like, who was kind of coming coming at you at that time? Like, and how big a how big an experience was that? Kind of starting off at Rangers. Aye, I mean, I was there from the age of eight uh, all the way up until I left school at sixteen. So, can I spent most of my childhood? Um, there was no Murray Park at the other place. Nowadays, it was an Ibox three nights a week and then an Astro across the road, the road and stuff. So, I, I spent a lot of my childhood. And Ibrox, but um, no, it was great. It was great grounding. My sort of team, um, 
I think. So Stephen Smith, uh, Craig Beatty, who ended up going to Celtic, Alan Hutton, was my team, Charlie Adam was he dropped the year below. Um I it was a good few players that went on to have have careers in the game and uh, it was great. It was a great ground, and at that time it was the whole Dick Advocate era, and was that whole year, and just from how it transpired a few years later, and I'd kind of moved on, but it was just a, a completely different level. Um, but no, it was great. You know, it was great grounding, and learned a lot from the coaches in there and the players around about me. So it was a, it was a really good grounding in the game, and, and it set me up for you know the actually going on to be a, a professional. Mm-hmm. And you move on to Birmingham, obviously, you go down south to Birmingham. Like, how, who kind of, you, you made one first team appearance, like, who gave you your debut for Birmingham? Uh, Steve Bruce. Um, what was he, was he so, like? I was great, great for me. When I signed there, it was Trevor Francis was the manager when I moved yeah. there when I was 16. Um, we were in the championship at the time. He got a sack my first year there and Steve Bruce came in and then we got promoted to the Premier League and kind of my first year. I was obviously just in the youth team, but, you know, it was um, it was great again. You come back from that that summer summer off, and like uh, there had been a, another level, another floor built in the training ground with a full size indoor pitch. Like the pitches had all been done up. It was just incredible. Obviously, just the money that the difference between the championship and the Premier League. And um, it was just everything just changed in the, in the blink of an eye. And fortunately enough for me, Steve Bruce kind of liked me. And uh, that night, like, that first season, I was involved in the, the, the Premier League and you know, travel most weeks and stuff with the the team and I was involved in most of the squads and always been the sort of um, 18th man hamper boy type thing and I was on, able to go on the bench like, five times that year and, and made my debut in the, the Premier League which was obviously something I, I still look back on fondly now. Is that one of the previous moments of your career? It was, I mean, eight minutes I played but it's, you know, you never take that away from it. It's eight minutes that, you know, dream, grew up as a young lad watching watching match of the day with my dad on a Saturday night and to go and to see myself on match of the day, sit, sit with my dad and watch myself coming on. It was, if you remember, match of the day went to ITV with Des Lino for a few years. That's right. So yeah. it, was, it was then. Um, so I've still got it now on VHS <laughs> video. So to see myself running, coming on and, and on match of the day, it was just three things that uh, was just brilliant. Mm-hmm. The bonus wasn't a good idea. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, and Wilson as well. Wilson was a Comalant season ticket holder, and that was the kind of club you signed for when you come back to Scotland. Like, Wilson, what's your memories? Like, do you remember Andy playing for Comalant? <laughs> well, again, it was uh, there was a lot of a lot of haste involved. Them, um, I wasn't uh, Jim Jeffrey's biggest fan, <laughs> um, as well. A lot of the support latterly, and I, I, I remember him. I remember one of these things, and I. I I think you maybe played two or three games. Aye, uh, I think three times I come on as a sub. Aye, and you, you weren't really given a, 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 you know, a, a fair amount of games, which, but there was guys like Naismith and Colin Nish in that there at that time, eh? So, and there was, I, I mean, Naismith was there, yeah, Nish, yeah. Gary Wales. I, I wasn't ready. I, I'd came, I'd been in that sort of academy bubble down south. I'd went out and loan a few times to different it's like a month here, two months there, three months. I hadn't played man's foot, men's football. You no, know, I wasn't ready for a Jim Jeffries or a Billy Brown snarling and spitting in my face and I'm just on their games by the way. You no, know, I wasn't ready for that. I, I I I was not ready. I had to go Lonely Queen of South and whatever, and I did okay there. And I, so right, that was that was on me. I don't really blame um, the manager for not giving him a chance. That, that was on me, and I had to go away and find my feet, and I left, and obviously signed for. Uh, well, the same that's, 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 that's it. As I say, K- Kelly were no great shakes under Jim Jeffries, mm-hmm. and I think that's what a wee bit of frustration. He was Queen of the South. You went on loan. But then when you went to Ross County, Inverness, and I think another spell at Ross County, you were scoring 20 plus goals. Oh, and I left that year, I left. Back then when we lost the likes of Naismith and Boyd, or, yeah, and then, no, no great disrespect, you weren't a loss because we didn't know what you could do. And then you mm-hmm. go to Ross County, who probably weren't much between them and come out at the time when you bang in, what, what, your first season with Ross County was what, 20, 25 goals or something? 29. And then, I mean, Kelly, 29. <laughs> 
No, I know, listen, but again, I don't blame him for that. I didn't deserve a chance to come out. Oh, well, we, do, we, do we blame Jim Jeffrey? Yeah, <laughs> only because the manager later, later on in my career at Dunfermline. And, he did really uh, well there as well. He scored a good few wins at Dunfermline as well. He, he, was, he was good. He was fine. He was great with me. And we kind of talked about, you know, what I'd done because I'd obviously left Kamala and then you play against them and stuff, but you don't get a chance to speak to managers or anything like that. And we kind of had a conversation one day just kind of in the lunchroom or whatever. And he, he, he just, we just kind of spoke about that. I was honest with him. I said, well, I, would, I don't blame you. I wasn't ready. I had to go and prove myself and I had to drop down to Ross County. And okay, I went up there and had a great season. But you know, I, you couldn't really blame Jim Jeffries. I probably wasn't doing. No, I was. I was, I was, I was being. I was being flipping there. <laughs> I was at the level every day in training. I didn't deserve to pick ahead of Colin Nish and May Smith and Gary Wales, and I wasn't better than them at that time. And where I was in my career, I was what was I, twenty one, maybe twenty two. But I hadn't played any football. I hadn't played any men's football. I didn't know how to play the game. I'd played in the academy and I'd been on the fringes. I was the same team. as Gary Wales at Command. Like, he didn't know how to play the game either. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different. He, he, hey, I tell you what, he did know how to play it when he was going out of contract. Though. Anytime, <laughs> anytime, he, honestly, anytime he honestly, yeah, anytime he came, a few players like that at that time. He used to rattle them, and he'd, he'd be. He should. You think why he's not Real Madrid? Yeah, his last yeah. months, he's gone. It's always the same. Always the same. But, uh, and they really get to see to be fair, so. But Andy, where would you kind of say you kind of got yeah. going? Like, where would you say you kind of best spell? Like when you. After you kind of left Gomala, oh, Ross County, Ross County, Why? Ross County for sure. Obviously, scoring twenty nine goals. Yeah. Uh, obviously, win, win, win the league that year as well. And it, it was, aye, that was that was my it was my first. I regard as my first proper season as a, as a professional footballer on a first team, and we had a really good side up there. And aye, it was it was really enjoyable. We we're all kind of young lads who'd maybe been released for bigger clubs, and we were trying to prove a point and we just done really well up there and it was a, a right good bunch off the pitch as well. We enjoyed ourselves and I it was just a really happy time and and um I it was that's where I, I would say my career started. And if when you like went to like who would you say was kind of the best manager you played under in your whole career? Like who could then get the oh. most out of you? Um again you probably look at where where kind of you as an individual sort of played their best football and obviously Ross County was well, it was actually Dick Campbell that signed me but he got a sack when we were top of the league and um, Derek Adams got the job. He was a player there. Mm-hmm. Obviously, George Adams was, was his dad who was the director of football at the time. So, he was probably always going to get the job at some point. So, he we were top of the league and then gave him the job and we obviously went on and won the league. And, you know, Derek Adams went on to be a good manager. So, he was he was a good manager in terms of very meticulous and how he planned things and he knew your job. Like, kind of knew every training session what you were going to do like before you turn up you did that training session on Monday and it became a bit boring and repetitive but I tell you what you knew your role on the pitch and I think why we were so well organised I think that's why he had the success he did at Ross County um, you know in the cup and stuff as well a couple of years later so he was, he was a good manager for me personally but then even later on like Jim McIntyre signed me at Dunfermline yeah. striker, yeah. striker. I, I think I learned a lot personally like as a forward off of him you know he was a really good, I didn't realise how good he was. He still joined in and training and stuff, obviously. He had a decent career and stuff, but he was tremendous. Not, not the biggest of strikers, but he, you, how to you use your body. And I, I was always wanting to fight with defenders and, you know, that way and just try and wrestle them and be stronger than them and stuff. And he kind of showed me like, just a different way of playing and using your body and getting on the shoulder and wrong side of people and things like that. So I really learned, learned a lot. Him. Um, even as a youngster, Steve Bruce, never seen him on a Monday to Thursday. He wasn't really on the training ground, never really took a session. He would just maybe stand and watch and but talk about man manager. He, that's what that's really best. And he's done it in the top level down south for, for how many years and he's still doing it now at Newcastle. So yeah. he just he just get the best out of him. And, and he just he felt like he could run through a brick wall for him. So different characters and different different attributes that sort of made them made them good. But again, even Jim Jeffries, what I liked about Jim Jeffries and as I say, hated him at Kamarnock, but then you, you, you get a bit older and you get him again later on and you knew how you you know you knew where you stood. See if you were terrible, he would tell you you were terrible. Mm-hmm. See if you were good, he would tell you you were good. But you just very straight in your face, this is how it is, spades a spade type thing. And I always respect that. You know, I, I was at um Inverness and Terry Butcher and 
everybody talks great things about Terry Butcher, but for me, he, he wasn't, and I, I didn't find him to be that. You know, he'd say some one thing to you, and then you come the Saturday and you wouldn't be playing, or he'd say something else. Or, you know, I always liked the managers that were always straight and to the point, and that's one thing I'd say about Jeffries. He, he was. He was definitely that. And I think all the good managers are, are that, you know, they're honest people and, and good people, never mind good managers, you know. Mm-hmm. And can I like, obviously when you can I stop playing football, you moved on, you've got quite, can I quite a good job now with Joma. Just tell us a bit about that, like, like how that came about, like what, you know, what it involves. I, I mean, uh, obviously, I'd, I'd kind of started a, a, an online degree, business degree, and I was 28, it was a whole Dunfermline thing with the administration and stuff, and I thought to myself, right. right I need to get the finger out here, I need to look, you know, this football's not going to last forever, I would say I was 28 at the time, so went away, started that, it was sort of four and a half years, so you come my last season I dropped into Albion Rovers and I was part-time yeah, for the first time in my career and you know, it was it was, diff- it was difficult, I found out I couldn't adjust to it, I was terrible when I went to Albion Rovers, you know, I was I was really, didn't perform at all, I just couldn't adjust to the whole part-time thing, it was just, I wasn't, I wasn't able to adjust to that, so I couldn't do it and I come to the end of your career and you hang up the boots. I was only 32 when I stopped playing, but <clears throat> it's just still relatively young. Um, I was six months away from finishing my degree at that point, and it's hard, <sighs> hard. Like you'd, I'd left school at 16, I hadn't had a job really. Yeah. Played football all the time, and you get to that point, you you don't know what you're doing yourself every every day, and it, it's really difficult. And you hear all, all the people, and I don't think there's enough. I don't think players help themselves enough as well. I think players are. Professional footballers are lazy, really, in, in a lot of way, and they expect everything kind of get done for them and told where to be, and told what to eat, told what to do, and everything's sort of done for them. And I think players are lazy, and they can do more to help themselves later in life. Because the fact of the matter is, you play your whole career in the Premier League in Scotland, you're still going to, going to have to get a job at the end of it. You know, you're not earning the money, you know, the, the, the salary and the wages in the Premier League, you're out with the old firm. Or, they're no, you know, they're no going to be enough to retire and hit a golf course on. So I think players need to think about about that a lot more. And I got to that stage, and I was applying for jobs. I think it was something like seventy six jobs I applied for, and got two interviews, and one of them was the job I got with Joma. So worked out great in the end, but it was a hard six months. Um, my wife had just found out we were pregnant with our first kid, and you know, it's just it was really, really difficult, really hard, hard time in in, in the life, and. But it worked out great, got the job with, with Joma just after I graduated and just come up four years now and it's been it's been brilliant. It's, it's a really good company to work for, still involved in sport, predominantly football and on a daily basis and I really enjoy it and and um, I just looking to kind of forge that new career for myself now. Yeah. So do you kind of take obviously like Joma I think they've got the kit deals with is it the Fairland and St Marinum te- like teams like that? Like do you can oversee I, their uh, kind of interest with them? Aye, so I kinda manage our pro teams and like Scottish Athletics and things like that. Yeah. Kind of level. And then we've got our retailers. So we've got eighteen retailers now in Scotland. So just kinda manage them as well. So it's good that it, we're really strong, particularly in the grassroots market, you know, boys' clubs and stuff. Well, that's where we're really strong and the pro stuff's good, but and that's what you see in the papers and on the T V and social yeah. media. But yeah, this is it's well. Mm-hmm. So like obviously like, during COVID you were in the news, like obviously you can you were kind of helping out in Spain. Just talk us a bit through what you were doing there, like because it was a bit, it was a brilliant story. I thought it was amazing like, what you were doing. I again, it was kind of more so the, the company rather than anything I was kind of doing personally. But I, they were just obviously Spain was really bad probably before us. They were kind of two or three yeah. months ahead of that in that curve, and it was really quite grim over there. And our head offices in Spain, uh, we don't have offices here, so our head offices in Spain, and literally like every single person that I kind of deal with on a daily basis. Someone close to them was dying. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was really quite grim over there at the start. It was they, they, we didn't have it anywhere near as bad as they did. Um, even maybe just where, where we are, just outside of Toledo, in a kind of small uh, outside of Madrid, a town called Toledo. It's kind of small town, and maybe it was just where it was as well, kind of localized. But uh, it was really grim. So, uh, the company were just helping. They were giving out, you know. Uh, like rain jackets and stuff when there was no PPE and all that yeah. kind of thing. Trainers to, for doctors and nurses in the hospitals that were doing all these crazy hours just to make them comfortable and loads of different things. They were just giving as, as much we were making we were making the mass on the kind of 3D printers that we've got and stuff like that. So just kind of like everybody just kind of try to muck in and help help where they can and we, 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 we did a bit of that in the UK as well and offered, offered some help and different, different sort of NHS 
and things like that. So no, it was um, it was good, but it was more more the company rather than me personally. To be honest. Brilliant. And are you still are you still involved? Obviously, you're doing a bit of commentary for Ross County, but you still involved? Do you do like are you involved in kind of coaching and things like that? Like are you still got a kind of no. still involved in the game in any way? No coaching. No, no. I don't. I never ever done my badges or anything. I, I can't. When I was at Dunfermline at the second spell, I, I took under twenties at the time and I enjoyed it and I got that wee buzz for it. And it's just, the last few years of my career, I was living year to year contracts and yeah, just yeah. that insecurity and coaching and managing. It's even worse, you don't even get a year sometimes. So for me, it was just again I had a family at the time and you get responsibilities. And for me, it just wasn't an option. I didn't. I had had enough of that. You know that that's what really from that point, uh, moment with the administration with Dunfermline. You know, after that, you know, it's year to year contracts, and I just had enough of that. And you know, I loved, I loved the game on a Saturday, and I loved the, I loved, still love football now. And it was just that whole other side of it. I was just ready. You know, I didn't get to the, my, the end of my career, and, and sort of, I, I was ready to retire. Is what I'm trying to say. You know, I'd, I'd enjoyed it for the last couple of years, and it was. I always pride myself being a good pro. I was never the most skillful or going to beat four players and stick it in the top corner, but I was always a good pro, and I found myself. You know, resenting the game a wee bit towards the end, and it, right. it just wasn't easy. so. That's when I knew it was time to can I call it a, call it a day. Um, don't I, I still play over thirty fives now? That that does me now. That gives me my fix. So uh, don't have to do any of the training or anything like that, and I, I can still play and score a few goals. So I, I enjoy the over thirty fives, and um, we've got a decent. We've got wee Stevie Murray actually plays with us. You'll know him, Mark. We Stevie Murray for Kamana. He's a uh, He's uh, he's not the most athletic build, let's just say that. But n- well, n- well. listen, none of us are right enough. But um, we <laughs> might still talk quality. That's for sure. Well, Kilmarnock have just well, last season they started a kind of former players union type thing, and every week one comes on, does a half time draw, and speaks to the fans and all that kind of thing. And it was the opening of it, and there was maybe maybe about 40, 50 players. Gary Hay, Paul the Jack, one of these guys there, Kevin McGowan, lights. And everyone's, you know, about a sit, kind of to the right hand side of the dugouts. And everyone's sitting, you know, I'm getting the glasses on, going, Who's that? Who's that? Guy? Who's that wee guy? Jesus. And I'm going, I don't know, is he some size? Who's he? Man? I mean, Kelly Rugby he played for. And that's who it was. It was Stevie Murray. And again, because, he, because he's small in height, he wasn't carrying it well. And I'm the one he's yeah. proper enough, but. <laughs> The, the ability that boy had with oh, a ball listen. in his was absolutely incredible. Every day in training. He's, he's, he's the uh, best player, honestly. Every day I, in training, he was the best player. And he, the wee man's an angry wee man, angry wee man syndrome. So he'd always yeah. be chatting at the manager's door. And, and uh, Jim Jeffries actually said to him, Look, I don't start you because I like to bring you on because the fans get a lift when you come on as a sub. So that's why I don't start you. I lose that lift for the fans if things <laughs> don't come well. And the wee man's gone, right, so I just don't play every week. I just come on to just give the fans a lift. So <laughs> I can imagine he took, he took that well. So I... Um, so that I, was I was good well. He was very good. He was very good. His feet are so quick and he's so skillful and you can imagine over 35s as a, a oh, few right. boys want to kill him and he's not like them for the fifth time and stuff like that. <laughs> Um, but I, listen, it's great. I enjoy. I still enjoy my football. I go and watch a game every Saturday, and I'll just pick a game at all different levels, and, and I'll go and watch a game on a Saturday. So I'm missing that this year. So, um, no, I love, love, still love the game, but um, my only involvement is selling the kit nowadays. Can, can I ask a question, Scott, if you don't mind? On you go. Why then? And I always like for uh, former professional or professional football players as you were, who's Who's the best player that you've played with and you've thought you, you're absolutely unbelievable, but who's the worst player you've played with? <laughs> I, don't, I don't want a, a name of a young boy to get released at 16. I want a player that will know. <laughs> you think, How on earth are you a millionaire? How on earth are you a professional footballer? And they're, they're maybe still be playing, maybe just retired. I, want, I, I don't want, I want big names here. <laughs> Uh, I'll start. I'll start with these. I'll start with the best one. So it was Christoph Dugarry, the French World Cup winner Aye. at Birmingham. Yeah, that guy. He he kept us in the Premiership. Aye, he was cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. the guy was ridiculous. Some of the things he did in training and stuff. And I don't know how Birmingham managed to, to sign him. I've no idea how they managed to get a hold of him. But he was literally just 
you, you just be standing, you end up just clapping and training just some of the things he did. He's just like, this guy's a different planet. He played for Barcelona, AC Milan, won the World Cup, his best mates with Zidane, him and Zidane have got restaurants all over France. He's just, this guy's a megastar and he's, he's, he's in Birmingham with all his mugs, you know. <laughs> funny, every day, you know, you're in the canteen and stuff and you had to put your plate, you didn't have to wash them, but you had to put it over to the side and, and you know, scrape the, the food into the bin and put your plate away. And every player had to do it, right? Dougie and I never done it. Just left it on the table. Every single day, he would just leave it on the table. And Steve Bruce, all the players were going, oh, you're not going to tell him to put his plate away? And he'd be like, it's Christoph. How can I tell him to put his plate away? <laughs> and he'd done it for, honestly, he was there, I think, two years, two and a half years, and he'd done it every day. Left his plate and I think, that was him. He was a total maverick. Oh, uh, a club car. You can imagine all the cars kicking about in the Premiership at the time, or the like, Lamborghinis and all that. And he just drove. It was an MG Rover. It was a local MG That's Rover. So plant really and they got they got free cars. That was a sponsor, and he just drove this MG Rover. Never bothered. Just that was him. He was just a total total maverick, total um, off the cuff. But what a talent! What a player! Didn't he own a pair of studs? Always wore moldies. Could be. Like a way to stalk on a wet Tuesday night, as they always say. <laughs> <laughs> he, he would wear these mouldies and never slip. Never. Right. Just, Cantona was the same. Cantona only wore moulded boots as well. Honestly, n- I never seen him on his ass once. Never slipped once. <laughs> um, just yeah, I, I, I played with better players than over thirty fives in terms of ability. <laughs> Stevie Murray, if you talk about we Stevie Murray in terms of actually what he could do with a football, you know, obviously he's just a terrible trainer. Terrible, but in a game, he would just, you knew you were getting out of him. He would, he would get in people's faces. He was a nuisance to play against. And he could play a wee bit, but to play the, the game, the amount of games at that top, top level, we're not talking about an average career here. He was played 500 odd games in the Premier League, you know, multi millionaire. And I, it was a strange one. It was a strange one. So, <laughs> Aye, that's what we want. That's the answers we're looking for. That's what we I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure he'll. he'll uh, you will remember me or I'll bother what my opinion is right now. He's, a, he's, a, he's an avid listener, Andrew. He's an avid listener. <laughs> we're waiting for yeah. Mark text and over the YouTube link. Oh, he's at Macclesfield now, isn't he? He's just been in at Macclesfield. Aye, he's the new owner of Macclesfield. Remember him in Strictly? Remember him in Strictly? Aye, aye. 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 I, I see now. He would wear outfits like that on most nights out anyway on Christmas Day, so that's an old... That's an old outfit for him, don't worry about that. He's, that's, he's a bit extravagant when it came see, to See, uh, I was just going to say, when, see when you touched on the part-time, that was obviously a first time coming to part-time football. Were you a bit naive? Like, were you think you've been full-time all your career and then you're coming part-time? Were you, did you think, like, no, like, you never took it serious, but did you think, like, these people only taking it as serious as, as what? Uh, somebody that's in uh, Monday to Friday is somebody that's, that's working all week and then they're coming training twice a week and playing a Saturday. Did you hang? Uh, uh, did you were a wee bit naive about about the standards and the the kind of level of that? Or, or I, I mean, it was it was to you? I, I, I was like, I was used to being like football was my be all and end all, but you know that's all I did every day and that's all I woke up. And it took me by surprise and obviously other guys have got careers and that's the most important that's what pays a mortgage and you know that's what looks after a family and that was really difficult Darren Young was a manager I'll be in overs and I kind of know him been against him over the years and stuff and, and it was one night we had a game I always remember this it was a Tuesday night so we trained Tuesday Thursday but we had a, a midweek game on a Tuesday night but we knew the Cliff and Hill, the pitch we knew the game was going to go off <laughs> to go through the the whole rigmarole, getting the ref out for the pits expression at 11 o'clock that day. And but the manager had booked training and we knew we had to turn up for training because we just knew the game was going to be off. So, so I think there was a pitch inspection. I don't even think it was 11. I think it was something like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So 5 past 3, the WhatsApp group, game's off, blah, blah, blah. So we'd been for training, I think 7 o'clock to report normal time for training. There was, only, there was something like nine guys turned up for training. And I'm like... Wait a minute, we are supposed to have a game tonight, and if the game aye, every aye, single aye, one of that squad would have been there. Aye, aye. But you know, they were all waiting. Where was it? I don't know, was, was it still game or Kevin Bridges that was on it? The, Live. I, <laughs> honestly, they don't, they don't got the tickets for that. They were all waiting. They knew, just knew they were going to miss training that Tuesday night because they'd all get tickets. Nine boys, and I said to Darren Young at the time, I was like, how can you accept that like, as a manager? How can you? 
you, you, how does I, I would be going nuts if I was a manager. I was going nuts when I was a player. Aye. And I, no, I wasn't exactly playing well at the time. But I'm still going, I can't accept that. That's just crazy. He's like, that's just how it is. That's part-time football. He said, you've just got to understand that that's how, that's a mentality for, for a lot of players. Not all of them, because, you know, guys, don't get me wrong, you take their football seriously as well. You know, it's a big commitment, getting away from work and, and, you know, even if it's a midweek game or whatever, but there's huge commitment and sacrifice made by these guys. So I'm not mm-hmm. sort of saying everybody's the same, but that was just, it's just a different mentality. You know, it's just play air and obviously you're in an hour and a half before the game, two hours before the game. Yeah. You go out the pitch, see what the pitch is like, and the boys are walking about. And there was actually a dog shite in the corner <laughs> of the pitch on the park. <laughs> you ask some of the fans, they'll say that was me last week, right enough. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, ah, it's, it's not, not the nicest of places. I don't know whether that... I, I only was there for a year, and I don't know whether that kind of <laughs> helped my decision to, to chuck it. Kind of killed my love for the game. And then I mean, to go upstairs to, to, to get the tunnel I and stuff like that. It's, it's a bit different, but these clubs are brilliant. You see the people that are at these clubs, and right. it's, their, it's their life and they sacrifice. Don't get paid. None of these guys are getting paid to do what they do. And you know, I, I really enjoyed it. I met some great people there, and, and it, it's it's a life, life. And so, uh, but I'll go back and watch I'll be in over games if they're at home and there's no other games I fancy going to and stuff. It's, that's, what, that's what Scottish football is all about. Brian Reid, there, Sean, you might get the call. <laughs> Brian Reid's your manager, aren't he? Uh, 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 yes, I. He'll need, be, he'll need to be struggling, won't he? No, big fan of yours, Shankers, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but aye, so that was my part time experience. Brilliant. It's been an absolute pleasure to be on, Andy. It's been really great to hear your stories and your opinions. I've really enjoyed it. I think the boys no, thanks for having me. It's my pleasure, well. to be honest. The boys, will, like, the boys will agree with me. It's been great to be on. No, any time, mate. No problem at all. Really enjoy. And if you want, is next time we're on our set with Joma stuff on for the sponsor. <laughs> we'll film it. Definitely, I know. I need to get that brand. I see Adidas and Under Armour there. I'm, I ah, have... no, the I'm a big fan. Of, you've got the contract for the colleges as well. That's right. Aye. In sports yeah, colleges, we will be all wear Joma stuff. Yeah, my right. boys club. My boys club. Aye, Dean Thistle, Dean Thistle as well, my kids as well. We've got a big share of the market in the UK, but particularly in Scotland, it's really strong for us, so mm-hmm. uh, keep, keep it going. Brilliant. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on, boys. Thanks very much for doing that again. Thanks, Scott, again. Cheers. 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 Cheers.